this example, I'll show how you can use Salamander's Grasshopper components to create a parametric model of a simple truss spanning between two points. To begin with, I'll create the centerline geometry of the truss using standard Grasshopper components. I'm going to assume a basic understanding of Grasshopper here, so I'll skim through this part quite quickly in order to get to the Salamander specific part. If you do need help getting up to speed with Grasshopper, however, I'll include some links in the video description to some other videos which will help you out. Following that, I now have a complete truss definition that I can use as a base. I've set this model up so that I can control the endpoints of the truss, I can control the depth of the truss, and I can control the number of bays in the truss. Importantly, I've also grouped together all the most important parts of the geometry at the end of the definition got my top cord, my bottom cord, my bracing members, and my posts. These are the curves that we're going to turn into salamander elements. The actual geometry doesn't matter too much. In this case we're using a truss as an example, but the same process from here on out is going to apply whatever geometry you're trying to create. To begin with, I'll take my top cord and bottom cord and create elements from these curves. I can do this using the Create Linear Element component found under the Salamander Free tab in the Model group. This component allows me to build up a linear element by specifying its centerline, its section, and its orientation angle. I'll plug my top chord and bottom chord curves into the L input to define the center lines. I'll next need to create a section in order to assign that to the element. There are several different ways we can create a section. One way is to use the I section component, which can be found under the Salamander Free tab in the Sections group. This allows us to define a custom I section. We can specify the name of the section, 
the depth, width, flange thickness, web thickness, root radius, and so on. This comes with defaults, so we can simply take our section family and plug it into the S input of our create linear element component. We should now see in the 3D view that section has been applied to those curves. As well as creating custom sections like this, we can also access the section library in order to retrieve catalogue sections. We can do this using the catalogue components under Salamander Free Sections. I'll use an iProfiles catalogue component in order to select an iProfile. scroll down to the bottom here and select a UC. I'll now apply that UC section to my bracing and my posts. Again I'll use the create linear element component in order to create elements from those curves. I'll then assign that UC section to it. Since this component will only provide this section description, in order to assign it as an actual section, I'll need to create that first. I can do that using the text to section component. This will take in a textual description of a section and will output a new section. That new section should now be assigned to our elements. Next, we'll restrain the ends of our truss by extracting the end nodes from our top and bottom chord elements and assigning them a restraint. To extract the nodes from these elements, we'll need to use the Get Nodes component. This takes in an element reference and will return references to the nodes at either end of those elements. Now that we have those nodes, we can set the restraints using the Restrain Node component. This takes in the node references that we want to restrain and also a fixity condition to be applied to them. This uses a special Bool 6D type which is custom to Salamander. We can set one of those up easily using the Bool 6D component in the Params group. This just allows us to easily select which degrees of freedom we want to restrain. I'll pin these nodes by turning on the X, Y and Z direction of fixity. Now that we've done that, we should see some geometry representing those fixity conditions being displayed at those nodes. It's worth pausing here for a second to consider one way in which salamander components are fundamentally different from most other grasshopper components. Grasshopper typically is value based. What I mean by that is that the data which is passed around between components is transitory and is created and destroyed as necessary. When you plug an input into a component, that data is copied and then acted upon. Even if there's no visual change between the object coming out of a component and the object going into it, those will be separate objects. Finite element software, on the other hand, is typically reference-based. That is to say, you have certain nodes, certain elements and so on, which can have properties applied to them, and those properties may be shared between different objects. The sections that we apply to our elements, for example, have one section object which is referenced by each of those elements. Each element does not have its own individual section. Salamander is reference based. Therefore, the objects which we see passing between components here are in fact object references rather than objects themselves. 
the linear element 1 and linear element 2 being produced by this component are the same linear elements that are being passed into this component here. The nodes which are coming out of it are references to those nodes rather than nodes themselves which will be copied by Grasshopper. These objects are also persistent and maintained between updates of the Grasshopper model. When a Grasshopper component is updated, Salamander will keep track of the relevant objects and create, update or delete them as required. This is a powerful feature of the software and it allows nodes, elements and so on that have been parametrically generated through Grasshopper to be synchronized with external packages such as Robot. However, there are a few side effects and it does take a little bit of getting used to. These nodes that we have just restrained, for example, will stay restrained until we specifically unrestrain them. This can be worth keeping an eye on if, for example, these nodes may end up moving around the model to different places where they might not need to be restrained anymore. In this specific example, it isn't a problem, but it is something to bear in mind. We've now finished all of the modelling that we're going to do. However, these objects that we've created inside Grasshopper only exist currently within Grasshopper. They don't exist inside Rhino, and nor do they exist inside Salamander. We can bake out Salamander objects the same way that we would any other type of geometry. However, this may not be the best way of doing it. When we bake out objects in this way, they'll be added to the current Salamander model, but any changes made in Grasshopper will not be reflected on them. We'll have to bake them out again in order to reflect those changes, and that may mean that we end up with some duplicate elements. An alternate option is to check the modify main model option on any salamander components. This is a global setting, and when checked, means that salamander components will no longer operate on a background model inside Grasshopper, but will operate instead on the main model inside salamander. This will then automatically create that geometry, which we can then select and modify manually inside Grasshopper. But unlike the manual baking option, if we make any changes to this geometry in Grasshopper, those changes will automatically be synchronized and reflected in the Salamander geometry as well. This setting can be accessed from the right-click context menu of any salamander component. It can also be set more permanently using the salamander auto bake component. This can be found under salamander free params. This is a component which allows us to toggle this auto baking behavior on or off at the press of a button. By plugging a boolean toggle into this, I can control whether things are auto-baked or not. Now that that's false, I can make modifications to the Grasshopper model, and these will not be automatically reflected inside Salamander. When I set that toggle to true, however, those changes will be made, and will continue to be made, for so long as that is true. This allows us to preview changes inside Grasshopper before we make our mind up and commit them into the main Salamander model. Once our model is in Salamander proper, we can then export that to other packages in the usual way. What we can also do if we want to more fully automate our processes is to export directly from Grasshopper. This will work on the, whichever model is currently active in Grasshopper, so we don't even need to bake out information in order to do this. In the export group, we have several different options for exporting. I'll use the GSA option in this case, but the process to run it for any other type of geometry is exactly the same. These components have several inputs. The first one is a right toggle, While this is true, the model will be written out. 
the next input is the file path to write to. I'll just write this out to my temp folder for now. When I turn the toggle to true, that file will be written out. It can be a good idea not to leave that turned to true, since writing out files can take a long time. The final input here, T, isn't strictly necessary, but it's there as a trigger. We can put any other type of input into here and once that input is finished updating, an export will be automatically triggered while the write toggle is set to true. This is useful if we want to make sure, for example, that all of our salamander components have finished firing and the model has been completely updated before we write out a new file. If we connect the end of any chains which involves salamander elements into that T output, then we know that this will only fire once all of those changes have been made to the model. Here is that temp folder, and there is that file that's been written out. As one final revelation, I'll admit that I was going through this example step by step from first principles in order to show you how the tool worked, but we can actually skip a lot of this work. Salamander comes with a generate Pratt truss component, which can do a lot of the geometry generation for us. All we need to give it is a top chord and bottom chord curves and the sections to apply to our chords, posts and bracing. It will then generate the geometry and the elements for us. We do need to slightly change the way that our nodes are being restrained in this case since the top and bottom chords are broken up between nodes. We can't just extract the nodes from these in this case because then it would restrain all of the nodes along the top and bottom of our truss. However this component does give you two collections of all of the nodes generated along the top and the bottom of the truss. We can simply find the first and last of these and then restrain those. We can also specify on this component a spacing between nodes. However, if we leave that at zero, this spacing will be automatically adjusted so that the bracing members are at approximately 45 degrees. Thank you for listening. Have a play around with the grasshopper components yourself and let me know what you come up with.